Greetings to everyone joining us tonight for our eighth event of the year is the Virginia Worker. We have more events to come and we hope you will continue to join us as we host guest speakers presenting on a range of topics covering the history of the Virginia working class and other relevant topics. Our goal as the Virginia Worker is to build a distinctly pro-worker and independent ideological pull of attraction for the Virginia working class, which otherwise does not exist. We're comprised of groups across the state who emphasize organizing workers independently from capitalist parties and their auxiliary organizations which promote a class collaborationist agenda to the detriment of Virginia workers. Our website is meant to popularize the struggles, campaigns, reports, and debate across the state affecting Virginia workers. And we welcome all contributions that fall in line with our mission statement, which you can find at thevirginiaworker.com. Now on to our presenter tonight. Uh, we have Sarah, who is the Associate Professor of History at St. Francis College, where she also serves as the Director of General Education and Director of the Honors Program. Her research focuses on the Black Freedom Movement of the 20th century, and she is author of James and Esther Jackson, Love and Courage in the Freedom, Black Freedom Movement. She has written several additional articles and book chapters on the Jacksons, including a forthcoming essay titled W.E.B. Du Bois, James and Esther Jackson, Cooper, and Promises of Intergenerational Solidarity in the Black Freedom Movement, which will appear in a special issue of American Communist History. Her new research project focuses on the fight that families of murdered Mississippi NAACP leaders waged for justice and commemoration in decades beyond the civil rights era. Uh, before we get into it, we just wanted to go over the ground rules for tonight. Uh, Sarah is gonna present on her book. And then after that, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. And if you have any questions, please type it in the chat box and we'll read them off to Sarah as they come along. Uh, without further ado, we'll pass it on to Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, again, I'm Sarah Rizudek. Um, I'm the author of James and Esther Cooper Jackson, Love and Courage in the Black Freedom Movement. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm also going to turn my camera off just to keep the connection as smooth as possible. Um, so bear with me for just a moment. <clears throat> Okay. Um, and uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Awesome. All right. So um, the topic I wanted to focus on today was uh, the Virginia origins of James Jackson's activism in particular. Um, I can speak to his wife's Virginia origins as well. She grew up in Arlington, uh, but I wanted to really zero in on the story of how uh, James Edward Jackson Jr. Um, grew up in Richmond and became a radical activist, a communist, and an advocate for uh, Black freedom in the 20th century. Um, James Jackson is probably best known as a founding member and longtime leader of an organization called the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, the SNYC uh, existed from 1937 to 1945 and it was established in Richmond. This organization was um, really kind of a precursor in a lot of ways to a lot of the civil rights organizations that emerged in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, a lot of the same sorts of campaigns, tactics, uh, movement strategies and so on were present in the 1930s and 1940s in the SNYC. And you see them crop up again in the 50s and 60s with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, CORE, uh, and other organizations. So uh, uh, 85 years ago in Richmond in February, uh, February 13th to 14th in honor of Frederick Douglass's birthday, the first all Southern Negro Youth Conference was held in Richmond. Uh, there were 534 young men and women in attendance. Delegates came from 23 states, the Belgian Congo, China, uh, and they represented about 200,000 people uh, from a large variety of religious, civic, fraternal, and political organizations. So even at its outset, the SNYC was uh, really working hard to represent uh, a mass of people across particularly the South, but the country and uh, internationally as well. The organization was focused on the problems of Southern black youth, but it also 
uh, sort of focus on the problems of adults uh, and problems of black and white youth and argued that everybody who was struggling was facing a sort facing a sort of similar set of problems, that the problems for black and white youth were the same and the solutions could be the same as well. So uh, the organiz organization was focused on interracial solidarity, global solidarity, uh, and focused on connecting itself and building coalitions with other groups as well. Um, the organization was focused on helping people stay in the South to fight to make the South what it should be for them. Um, at the conference, one of the delegates recalled that the delegates were uh, determined not to go to the crowded urban cities to try to compete for jobs in the North and that they were persistent in their belief that the South, which was their home, must yield them a living in education, full citizenship rights, including the right to vote and the right to be free of terror. Um, at the talk or at the conference, uh, another youth leader named Edward Strong gave a talk where he emphasized the contrast between what he described as the land of potential with plenty of science, natural resources, and every possible equipment to place at the disposal of man and the lack of legislation against lynching and poll taxes. So this newly formed organization uh, validated Black Southerners hope that democracy could be fought for and won in the United States, even amid the woes of the Great Depression. One of the key organizers of the Southern Negro Youth Congress was James Edward Jackson Jr. Uh, he was 23 years old when uh, he came to lead this organization. And so what I wanna talk about and focus on is how he comes to this point where he's leading this organization that ends up being enormously influential for over a decade in the South in the United States. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how his upbringing, his education, his political development are all reflected uh, in this moment when the SNYC is established. So on the screen, you have a photo of the Jackson family. Um, uh, this is James Edward Jackson Sr. seated holding baby Clara. Uh, his wife, Clara, is standing above. Uh, the, the oldest daughter is Alice. And then this is James in the corner. Uh, and his friends and family all referred to him as Jack throughout his life. So I'll probably slip into calling him Jack a bit during this talk as well. Uh, now, when James Edward Jackson Jr. was a small boy in Richmond, Virginia in the early 20th century, he would stand outside of his father's pharmacy on the corner of Brook Road and Du Bois Avenue every evening and wait. And he would smell the strong stench of sweat and tobacco, which would waft his way before he saw anything coming. And then he would see a throng of people in the distance. Uh, this procession was made up of tobacco workers heading home from Richmond's tobacco factories. The workers were black, mostly female, and desperately poor. Many of them were clad in burlap tobacco sacks that they had taken from the factory because they could not afford clothing. As Jack observed, the struggle for survival and poverty was written in the ragged clothes and shoelaces and the conditions of the houses they lived in. The women were exhausted, often ill, and trapped in dire poverty. And even though their circumstances were difficult, the women would sing and shout with joy as they headed north toward their homes. Jack said good evening to each woman as she walked past the pharmacy, and he would stand outside until the last worker passed. Jack's lifelong activism for Black freedom, his eventual membership and leadership in the Communist Party, and the development of his political outlook were rooted in this memory. Uh, as a young boy growing up in segregated Richmond, it was not difficult to develop an understanding of how race and class provided or denied opportunities for people. Uh, Jack excelled in school. His classmates and neighbors were the desperately poor children of tobacco workers. He noticed that many of the poor students who had some academic success faced difficulties as they grew older. 
As they became increasingly able, he recalled that these children were, quote, part of the breadwinning combination of their families. After school and on weekends, they hauled, they worked long hours selling papers, shining shoes, gathering junk, hauling groceries. So the economic demands of struggling families in a struggling community forced intellectually capable students to leave school for unskilled positions that would sustain their family, but would not help them to advance. Jack saw clearly that the privileges of his family's more comfortable economic status uh, afforded him uh, a lot of promise for the future and the difficulties that his classmates faced never left his mind. Um, so Jack was the son of uh, one of Richmond's first black pharmacists, James Jackson Sr. Uh, and he had a pharmacy in Richmond uh, and Jack's sort of early on uh, life goal was to follow in his father's footsteps and take over the pharmacy. He did eventually go on to get a pharmacy degree from Howard University um, and maintained his pharmacist license well into his old age, even though he never practiced. Um, and so here you see a photograph of him as a very young boy with his father's mortar and pestle. Uh, and as he became aware of Richmond's stark social and economic divisions, he immersed himself in scholarly, artistic, and athletic endeavors. When he was about 12 years old, uh, Jack organized the first troop of Black boys admitted into the Boy Scouts of America in Virginia. Uh, the Boy Scouts were geared toward middle-class youth, and they formed in 1910 alongside another, a number of other youth organizations that sought to provide structure and regulation to children's recreation. Uh, scouting reinforced what people referred to as boys work, which was an essential component of developing the masculinity that drove politics and patriotism during this period. It's also no coincidence that, um, that the Boy Scouts were established to teach young men survival skills after industrialization had moved people out of the fields and uh, into of sort of very mechanized jobs, particularly in the middle class. Uh, Jack saw in the Scouts an opportunity for what he described as a life of evangelical work in strictest conformity to the credo and laws of the worthy order. The Scouts emphasized a drive for individual achievement, but also the necessity of team play as part of their mission. It's as a Boy Scout that Jack first has a really sort of poignant and important encounter with the racism in Richmond. Um, he felt that, you know, really wearing this uniform would draw the respect of his fellow citizens, as it meant that the young men wearing the uniform had resisted the overwhelming temptation of illicit and soul-destroying pleasures, as he described it, in favor of social responsibility and respectable manhood. This didn't apply to him, though. Shortly after acquiring his uniform, Jack, quote, inadvertently sat beside an aged, dignified, aristocratic looking white couple on the rearmost seat of the Chamberlain Avenue bus, apologizing as I did so. Although Jack was well versed in the Jim Crow way of life, uh, his youth, his uniform and his faith in humanity had not prepared him for what happened next. The man, uh, as Jack would called later, quote, like some knight accosted by a dragoon, leaped up, seized my scout axe, and holding it menacingly over my head with tremulous hand and hysterical phrases, ordered me, uh, and there are a lot of racial epithets here that I'm not going to repeat, uh, to stand up where I belonged. I searched the eyes of his woman companion with wide eyes, with pain and soul searing shock. I questioned her eyes to find a reprimand there for his act of barbarian manners, but I saw only cold, steel, gray pools of religious, racial arrogance there. Something in me dies, never to be born again, and something new was born, a ferocious hatred for the haters of my people, later to be enlarged to embrace all of the oppressed world. From 12 to 16, I lived in a world of hate. So as an adolescent, Jack learns this lesson that, uh, racism uh, could be so fierce that it could turn 
dignified, aristocratic looking white people into total monsters. Um, and the cold indifference of the female companion of this man um, really moved him as well. So the humiliation and fear that accompanied this experience led Jack to guard himself against the pain of racism by using hatred as a shield. Uh, Jack continued in the Boy Scouts until he was 16 and when, when he earned the rank of Eagle Scout. Uh, the ceremony where new Eagle Scouts received their honors from the governor of Virginia also reinforced for Jack that his accomplishments did not supersede his race in the eyes of the most powerful man in Virginia. The ceremony for the newly inducted Eagle Scouts was at the John Marshall Hall, uh, which I looked up and I believe is now a wedding venue. Uh, and in that period, it was known as Society's Sanctuary of White Supremacy. Uh, and Jack recalled that the only entrance for Blacks was the freight elevator. He was only allowed to invite his father along, although several family members accompanied most of the other scouts. His father had to sit off to the side of the rest of the audience in wooden folding chairs. And Jack sat on one side of the platform while the 11 white scouts sat on the other side. When the time came for Virginia Governor John Garland Pollard to pin the badges on the new Eagle Scouts, he honored each white scout with his badge, a handshake or congratulatory pat on the head, uh, and just general warmth. When he saw Jack, he, quote, stepped back and grunted. For me, he tossed the award and I caught it. Though this was cause for humiliation, uh, Jack used the moment to exhibit the character traits of a proud Eagle Scout. He recovered quickly from the shock of the affront, pinned the badge to his own shirt, and put his hand to his forehead in salute. He recalled the audience applauded that, and they separated themselves from the rudeness of the governor. This experience leads Jack into activism in a new way. Uh, after the event, he decided to take a stand. At 16, uh, he was aware of the injustice he had just encountered, and he remained hopeful about his ability to generate change within the Boy Scouts. He wrote a letter to James E. West, who was the chief scout of the Boy Scouts of America, and he hoped that a respectable, well-written, well-reasoned argument against segregation would highlight the absurdity of racial division within the organization. He described his encounter with the Virginia governor at the Eagle Scout ceremony and his frustration with separate white and black scouting. Uh, he pointed out that racial segregation within the Boy Scouts was an obvious injustice and insisted that the Scouts be integrated. But West sent a defensive reply and Jack resigned from the Boy Scouts in protest. Shortly after, uh, James Jackson enrolled in Virginia Union University at the age of 16. Virginia Union stood in view of the Carrington and Michaud uh, Tobacco Stemming Company. And this juxtaposition of menial labor and higher education illustrated the contrast in economic prospect for, prospects for Black Richmond youth. Uh, and this was something that uh, James Jackson was very cognizant of as he was growing up uh, and continued to recognize as he entered college. So because he had developed this sense of class consciousness and witnessed deep poverty in Richmond, despite his family's status, Jack came of age believing that college students felt superior to the surrounding community. Uh, now his family, uh, were, his, both his parents were college graduates. His mother was uh, one of the first women to attend Howard University and his father had attended Howard as well. Um, so he grew up in a setting where he was expected to go to college. His older sister was part of a lawsuit in the 1930s uh, to gain admission to the University of Virginia Law School. Um, so his family was very active in education. He understood though that the cost of higher education, particularly in the context of the Great Depression, made it a prohibitive luxury and that many of his high school classmates, no matter how gifted, could barely entertain the notion of college, let alone make it a reality. So initially, despite going to Virginia Union, he tried to stay true to those roots 
and quote, rather ridiculously strained to keep himself pure of any real identification with the manners of the collegian. When he became immersed in college culture though, he learned that his earlier viewpoint was misguided. He discovered that most college students weren't quote, the arrogant conceited asses of his stereotype, but regular young men and women toiling at odd jobs after school hours, denying themselves small pleasures, and along with their parents, pinching and saving that they might buy the tools of higher learning to make something really worthwhile out of their lives. This realization was crucial in the development of Jack's politics. Growing up surrounded by poverty and racism gave him empathy and insight into the daily struggles of the working class, and his education became the foundation for efforts on their behalf. Uh, Jack earned average marks in college, uh, but his reputation as a charismatic campus leader started early in his college career when he became the president of his freshman class. He encouraged his peers to use their education to improve the conditions of the work, working class worldwide. Jack delivered a speech on freshman day entitled The World Beyond the Campus, and the speech was reprinted in the Intercollegian and the Richmond Times Dispatch. As his perspective on the social position of college students evolved, he saw his classmates' passion, ambition, and sense of sacrifice for the potential of global change. He began by asking his fellow students to imagine walking beyond the pristine campus to another section of Richmond. He described the despair poverty had brought for Blacks in other parts of the city, and then connected the problem to worldwide poverty. His speech closed, quote, 10 million Chinese destitute, are destitute, no food, no homes, no hope. A person misses his evening rice, we echo the pangs of his hunger. There is a world beyond the campus. He described how the adversity caused by Richmond's racial and economic divisions uh, was not unique to the city, the state, or the South. Uh, and he begins to really relate these local struggles to an international economic context. His classmates were deeply impressed by the speech and they nominated him to attend an interracial seminar in North Carolina the following summer. Um, this was a YMCA uh, conference at Kings Mountain. And at that conference, Jack met the first white people who did not treat him as though he was inferior. The seminar deepened his belief that productive change in the conditions in the South should include all members of society and that people of all races working together to improve the social, economic, and political climate could make a really important impact. So this is a really transformative moment from when he had been on the bus with that white couple uh, where he really internalized a lot of hatred uh, in this moment on meeting these other uh, really motivated and passionate young people of all races, he starts to see um, a real promise in interracial working class solidarity. He also met a communist, a young white communist at the seminar. And after conversations with him, uh, he devoted the summer of 1931 to the study of Marxism and joined the communist party. So these experiences in his early life point to a young man who had been searching for a way to reconcile his privilege as a member of the middle class with the ways that he experienced racism and oppression and then translate his experiences into useful actions. For Jack, the Communist Party offered a path away from the hatred he had harbored for whites as he saw the organization as a vehicle for productive change for impoverished and struggling people around the globe. Um, and so this moment really introduces for him a new way of thinking about the connections of race and class struggles, the links between local, local statewide, national, and international. And all of this leads him to become one of the founding members and organizers of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, the SNYC was established in Richmond in 1937. Uh, initially, it was kind of rooted in a 1936 conference of the National Negro Congress, which was another um, organization around this time 
Uh, but the organizers of the SNYC wanted to really focus particularly on the problems of Black youth in the South. Um, and one of the SNYC's first activities after it was established in Richmond in February of 1937 was aiding in the unionization of over 5,000 Black female tobacco stemmers in Richmond. And this is the very same group that Jack had greeted nightly as a child. Um, so Jack really brings to the SNYC all of his upbringing, all of his experiences, all of his insight into the world around him and starts at this local level in Richmond to help people that he had you know, seen walk by his father's pharmacy every single night um, as he was growing up. Uh, and so he advocated that the group uh, work with the Congress of Industrial Organizations to organize Richmond's tobacco workers into a union. The deplorable conditions of Richmond's uh, tobacco workers were rooted in a long history of racial and economic oppression. By the early 20th century, Black women in Virginia monopolized the stemming of tobacco. Uh, tobacco rehandlers were 98% Black, and these workers were unable to advance to skilled labor positions um, because of segregation within the tobacco industry. So certain jobs were available for white workers, certain jobs were available for Black workers, and most often the skilled positions were reserved for white workers. So uh, Black workers were constantly stuck in very low level positions with no opportunity for advancement. So to stem tobacco, um, a worker would fold the leaf in half and remove the stem. Efficient technology for this process had not yet been developed. Um, and the black female workers in this occupation were paid based on the weight of the stems that they had removed from the leaves. So on average, tobacco stemmers earned a meager $5 per week. Uh, and that's about $105 in today's, um, uh, today's terms. So that's not nearly enough to make ends meet. Management, um, of course, cared more about tobacco profits than the welfare of the workers. Uh, factories seldom contained adequate dressing rooms or toilets, and factory windows were, keep, were kept closed uh, to retain the moisture in the leaves, making the rooms extremely warm for the workers who, as I mentioned before, often had no choice but to wear clothes made from discarded burlap tobacco sacks. So they're wearing clothes that are heavy and uncomfortable and not very breathable. And uh, without ventilation, the air was not breathable. And so workers had to cover their faces with handkerchiefs to avoid inhaling dust. Um, and the humidity was unbearable, but the cruelty of the bosses only made the working conditions worse. The bosses were particularly hard on black women workers who comprised the majority of the lowest uh, paying and most ruling positions. Um, as the historian Robert Korstad writes of tobacco strikes several years later in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, black women were subjected to poor treatment on the basis of both race and gender. Foreman quote, had virtually no constraints when it came to black women. They failed to allow regular breaks for the women, even if they were pregnant or menstruating, and regularly implemented speed ups to increase production. As one export leaf tobacco company worker known as Mama Harris put it, quote, it took me just one day to find out that preachers don't know nothing about health. They ain't worked in no tobacco factory. Uh, the factory is also employed, uh, as you can see, children and elderly people as stemmers as well. Uh, and men could occasionally get slightly more skilled positions. So many of the children who left school at an early age to provide their families with additional income by working in the tobacco industry were the offspring of adult tobacco workers. Jack observed that the number of children who had remained in Richmond's black schools was, quote, reduced by the man's deep pocket. For these children, returning to school after they found a means of income in the tobacco industry was neither a priority nor an option. 
So in 1912, the Tobacco Workers International Union of the American Federation of Labor had offered membership that would lead to improved wages and conditions. And by 1920, uh, about 35,000 or 3,500 workers had, in, had enrolled. Uh, membership meant little though to the workers and conditions did not improve. By 1925, the Tobacco Workers International Union retained only 100 members in Richmond. So in these terrible conditions, uh, people were going to work every day. Um, and then on April 16th, 1937, there was a spontaneous walkout of unorganized workers at the Carrington and Michaud plant. Uh, and this began in response to a work speed up without a corresponding raise. The strikers petitioned the Richmond community for assistance in organizing and collective bargaining. And for 24 hours, their plea went unanswered. Uh, but the SNYC, which was in the beginning stages of working with the Congress of Industrial Organizations, responded hurriedly uh, and joined with a semi-organized citizens committee to help the strikers. Their demands included wage increases, 40 hour work weeks and recognition of the union. Um, and so without the assistance of the tobacco workers industrial union, the workers and the SNYC decided to form a new union. Uh, and this union was called the Tobacco Stemmers and Laborers Industrial Union. Within 48 hours, um, dialogue began between the union leaders and the tobacco bosses, and the contract was renegotiated just four days after the strike began. The state sent a representative from the Department of Labor to ensure that negotiations went smoothly, and even the representative was appalled at the existing labor and work conditions. The quick settlement of the spur of the moment strike at Carrington and Michaud reflected management's desire to get the factory running as expeditiously as possible. Uh, they were unaccustomed to worker defiance uh, and factory managers were not willing to risk the cost of a long strike. Uh, and as the historian Robert Love argues, the strikers courage and determination had cost CNM little in terms of dollars but represented a major challenge to the established sensibilities of Richmond's white employers. The Carrington and Michaud strike initiated a series of strikes in Richmond's tobacco industry that extended into 1938, and the SNYC remained involved in worker organization. By the end of April, 1937, uh, 22-year-old Jack, along with 21-year-old uh, Virginian Francis Grandison, and Chris Alston, a 23-year-old SNYC member who had been an auto worker and unionizer, union organizer in Detroit, uh, enrolled over 5,000 tobacco stemmers into the Tobacco Stemmers and Laborers Industrial Union, which was newly an affiliate of the CIO. Jack became the educational director for the union effort while Grandison uh, worked as the business agent for the union and Alston was the union's main organizer. Uh, whereas the, Amer the segregated American Federation of Labor uh, from which the CIO had separated had failed to make union membership meaningful for black workers, Jack and the SNYC promptly promised that conditions would change for the stemmers affiliated with the CIO. So strikes followed at I and Vaughn and Company, Laris Brothers, the Tobacco Byproduct and Chemical Corporation, and the Export Leaf Tobacco Company. The strikes typically resulted in higher wages, paid overtime, and better conditions. Uh, the Carrington and Michaud victory inspired workers, and in the three months following the spontaneous walkout, strikes at three factories resulted in settlements, and workers lost less than four weeks total of work. Um, in spite of this, the strikes grew progressively more complicated and drawn out. As the union effort expanded in Richmond, the divisions between unskilled black laborers and skilled white laborers increased. The Tobacco Workers Industrial Union and the Tobacco Stemmers and Laborers Industrial Union competed for the right to control the union at Laris Brothers and segregation intensified that struggle. Uh, in addition, the strikes, uh, as the strikes progressed, stemming was becoming a less stable segment of the tobacco industry. Uh, the industry expanded, but technology was improving, so fewer stemmers were needed. And this meant that the shift 
this shift meant that the proportion of Black women working in Richmond's tobacco industry was shrinking. So there's a lot going on in this moment that's affecting, um, you know, the the improvements in conditions, but also uh, new limitations on job opportunities. And there's also a ton going on nationally at this time. Um, in the midst of the series of tobacco strikes in June 1938, Congress passed the Wages and Hours Bill, which was part of the Fair Labor Standards Act that provided for a 40 cent per hour minimum wage. The Fair Labor Standards Act also outlawed child labor. Um, and out of fear that this would significantly increase or even double the price of tobacco, the tobacco manufacturer's president, uh, E.J. O'Brien, called for a campaign to, quote, educate the public about the humane paternalism of the tobacco industry. Uh, he argued that increasing tobacco wages to $10 per week would prevent the industry from, quote, provide providing a place for elderly, sick, and disabled people to work. Um, upon close examination into the industry by the union, however, the workers discovered that the vast majority of tobacco uh, industry workers were adults in their prime who received less than 2% of the tobacco profits. And I wanna take a minute to just uh, think about the language that the Tobacco Manufacturers Association president is using um, to describe what this industry is providing for workers. Um, he's arguing that they're providing a place for people who would otherwise have nowhere else to be. And he describes it as humane paternalism. Uh, and this language was something that was utilized in the 19th century to defend slavery. Um, you know, people argued that, um, you know, slaves would have nowhere to go. And this was a paternalistic system that provided for people. So I think that that, that, that parallel in language is really important here. The strike at the export leaf tobacco factory uh, was the longest. It, start, or it started on August 1st, 1938. It lasted for um, 18 days. The company stemmers were the lowest paid in Richmond. One striker pointed out the wage disparity in a sign that read Export Leafs Vice Prez was paid $34,047 a year. We strike for $10 a week. Um, and so uh, that's approximately, it's like something like $700,000 a year for the vice president. Um, and it's a uh, it's very small annual salary for um, for the striking workers. Um, at the outset of the strike, the powerful factory threatened to close its doors and just reopen elsewhere. But with the public support, the strikers won pay raises, union recognition, and improved conditions. The movement in 1937 to 1938 was the first major series of strikes in Virginia since 1905 and the first major victory for organized black labor in Virginia. Richmond Urban League director Wiley Hall considered the CIO campaign, quote, the most significant thing that has happened to Richmond Negroes since emancipation. One of the other unique features of this series of strikes that really reflects um, not just the, the sort of power of organized labor in Richmond at this moment, but also the way um, Jack's sort of political coming of age informed his own activism was in uh, just an increase in working class solidarity across industries in Richmond. In the export leaf strike, uh, 200 members of the predominantly white female amalgamated clothing workers joined the black tobacco workers on the pit picket line and pledged $50 to help the strikers. In addition, uh, the Newspaper Guild, the American Federation of Teachers, and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union offered their assistance to Richmond's striking tobacco workers. Um, Jack explained, quote, the black workers were the pace setters in the struggle. They had nothing to lose, everything to gain, and very little to defend, and this was the base of their militancy. Jack recognized that the distinct racial separation and gender division of labor were deliberate. He noted that, quote, it was not accidental on the part of the bosses to utilize the racial factor against the unification of the working classes. Uh, in addition 
uh, the addition of the amalgamated clothing workers to the export leave factory uh, picket line illustrated to Jack the extent of labor exploitation and solidified his belief that unity among all workers across race and gender lines um, could lead to dramatic changes. So the, um, by the time the tobacco strikes ended, uh, they had helped the Southern Negro Youth Congress establish itself as an influential force across the South. The success of the strikes uh, was a victory for um, this sort of moment for communist activists who were working through organizations that weren't restricted to particular political affiliations. Uh, this is known as sort of the popular front movement in the 1930s. Um, and activists like Jack earned the respect of the workers that they represented. Um, in the 1940s, Raleigh Durham's tobacco industry followed Richmond with a series of strikes that merged labor concerns and civil rights. And the SNYC's earlier campaign in Richmond had led the way. Uh, there were um, occasional upticks in divisions between the city's middle and working class blacks. Um, but the victory was tremendous, not just for Richmond's tobacco workers and working class people across the city, but also for the SNYC as it was establishing itself as a force. Uh, and for Jack, of course, the events in Richmond were the culmination of his upbringing, education, and young adulthood in, in that city. Um, so I'm going to stop here, um, but I'm also happy to talk about Esther Cooper Jackson, who you can see an adorable little toddler picture here. Um, and I can also talk about the uh, sort of extent of their activism beyond Virginia uh, as they moved the SNYC to Birmingham, Alabama, as Jack became more involved in the Communist Party leadership and the family moved to Detroit and then New York. And happy to also talk about uh, Esther Cooper Jackson's uh, role in establishing and managing Freedom Ways magazine. Um, so I'll stop my screen share here and we can open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that presentation. Um, again, for the folks in the chat or in the uh, event here, if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box and I will read them as they come along to Sarah. So maybe we'll give folks a minute to formulate their questions. So Mike says uh, the Jacksons spent decades in the CPUSA and in the struggle generally. Uh, what contributed to their decision and the ability to stay involved in radical politics for so long? Sorry, you cut out a little bit there. Can you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. The Jacksons spent decades in the CPUSA and in the struggle generally. What contributed to their decision and ability to stay involved in radical politics uh, for so long? Um, so I, I think that one of the things was this, this these early formative experiences. Um, for Esther, she grew up in a similar sort of household, uh, very middle class. She had a lot of opportunities afforded to her in a time when a lot of people didn't have opportunities. Um, she attended Oberlin College uh, and went on to get a master's degree at Fisk University in sociology. And her study there was about um, domestic workers. And so she interviewed a lot of domestic workers and talked about their experiences in relation to trade unionism. Um, and in that time, she also worked at a settlement house in Nashville. Uh, and she recalled that that was the first time she saw real poverty. And so she had that same sort of moment where she, you know, she recognized the privilege of her upbringing and the opportunities that she had and decided to use her voice for, um, for this type of activism. So she attended the 1939 um, Southern Negro Youth Congress conference, and that's where she met Jack for the first time. Um, she was already a communist by that point. 
Um, and they, she basically faced this choice where she could go on um, to earn a PhD in Chicago uh, in sociology and work with some really prominent scholars, or she could stay in Birmingham and um, just be part of the struggle. And that was the choice that she made. She chose to stay in Birmingham. She chose to be an activist. And then ultimately her, her love story was a factor in that as well. Um, and so Jeff was, uh, he, he becomes part of the leadership of the Communist Party in various roles, uh, starting around 1946, 47. Um, and she was very supportive of that. She uh, continued to take roles as they aged out of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, she played roles in the NAACP and the Civil Rights Congress when they were living in Michigan. Um, and just remained part of sort of leftist black circles as they moved to New York. Um, and Jack, of course, was one of the communist leaders who was indicted in 1951 um, in the second round of Smith Act indictments. Um, so the sort of second stringers. And he was one of the people who went underground um, in response to his indictment. So he was underground for almost five years. He actually emerged from the underground and walked into the police station in New York and said, I believe you're looking for me. Um, and uh, um, then stood trial, was convicted. And then in between his, um, the time he was convicted and when he was supposed to start his sentence, the Supreme Court heard the Gates versus United States case, which basically said that you can't, um, like that conspiracy to advocate the violent overthrow, it was, wasn't was really a thing you could like convict people on, hold people to. Um, so while he was underground, he actually writes under a pseudonym for political affairs, which is the Communist Party's main journal at the time. Um, and he wrote under the pseudonym Charles P. Mann and he would sign things C.P. Mann, um, which is another little reflection of his, his humor. But um, one of the things that he does in these writings in the 1950s when he's underground is he starts talking about how the party should respond to the emerging civil rights movement. Um, and so he has this sort of protection of the pseudonym to be a little critical and to come at this with a lens where he can shape party discourse in a new way by encouraging the party to kind of go back to the popular front years and do what they were doing in the 30s where they're not seeking to take over other organizations, but like listening to activists from all angles and working together. Um, and he starts to advocate for that in the 50s while he's underground. Um, and when he emerged, um, he was part of the 1959, um, the, the sort of revision of the communist policy on what they called the Negro question at the time, which is the first time they had really re revised their position since the uh, 1928. Black Belt thesis, um, which basically said to treat like Blacks in the South as a nation within a nation. Um, so he is able to kind of retain his commitment to communism because he sort of sees himself as a person who's able to influence it. He's able to kind of push policy and shape the organization from within. Um, and he's, he's, uh, you know, as a personality trait as well. I mean, he was a, he was kind of just a stubborn person. Um, you know, he, he stuck with things um, and believed in them and didn't waver. Um, Esther Jackson uh, changed a little bit over the course of her life. In 1956, she actually stepped back from the party. Um, she remained committed to the ideals, but no longer wanted to be a part of the, uh, the party itself. Um, and part of it was the ordeal of having her husband gone for five years, being followed and threatened and harassed by the FBI, um, and the sort of trauma of that experience, even though she had a lot of support from, from the party itself. But then she was also um, really put off by the revelation of Stalin's crimes with, the, with Khrushchev's release of um, that information in 1956. But she remains committed to the same sort of idea that coalitions of organizations with different ideas should work together to create positive change. Um, and their relationship and their ability to support one another, even when they did have political differences, um, really reflected that sort of solidarity that they tried to bring 
with them when they went into other settings? I don't know if that answers the question. That's sort of how yeah. it's. No, I think that was a great uh, summary there. I would to sort of piggyback off of that. I was curious, like, what was there any sort of influence by like Garveyism, Black nationalism, or Pan Africanism within that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, they, they're they both growing up in, you know, in that era when Garveyism was popular. Um, James Jackson's father uh, would host these, you know, uh, gatherings of uh, Black men in the community to talk about issues and debate and discuss what was going on. Um, and they were very, um, they were very influenced by Du Bois and kind of stuck to his ideas. Um, and so, you know, they would debate whether Du Bois or Booker T. Washington, for example, had the right idea. And um, they would have back and forth about all of these things, but they really, um, you know, I, I think the Garveyism, while it was influential and sort of in the atmosphere, was, um, was not really a part of their approach to politics. That said, um, sort of black internationalism was very important. Um, and international youth movements were very important to them. Um, in 1945, while um, Jack was overseas, uh, he was in the China, Burma, India theater of World War II. Um, Esther was at home with her young daughter and she got selected by the SNYC to represent the organization at the World Youth Conference in London. Um, and, you know, she debated for a minute whether she was going to go and had a little bit of a back and forth, like, argument in letters that took, you know, two weeks to get to where they were going, but they had this back and forth, like, he wanted to be there when she traveled the world for the first time, but she wanted to go to this opportunity. Um, so she went to the World Youth Conference in London and met activists from all over the world. Um, and um, she also took the opportunity while she was there to number one, go to Stalingrad to help rebuild after the war, but then also met Du Bois in London. Um, and he was there working on Pan-African issues at the time. And then they developed a rapport uh, when he came back and he spoke to the Southern Negro Youth Congress in 1946 um, in one of his last big uh, public addresses. And, um, you know, really drove home the idea that the struggles that Black youth in the South were facing, and Black working class youth in the South were facing, um, they were very similar to what people in the decolonizing world were facing. And so there's a lot of solidarity on that front um, that comes through. In the 1960s, when Black nationalism sort of has another surge uh, and the Panthers emerge, Malcolm X emerges, there's some debate because the Panthers in particular are um, you know, they're somewhat inspired by various aspects of communist ideology, Mao's Little Red Book and things like that. Um, but there's not a lot of sort of cross-pollination at that moment with the party because the party is a little bit more insular, a little bit shrunken at that time. Was there any response from like the bird machine to the Southern Negro Youth Conference and their demands on like anti-lynching laws and the poll tax and things like that? Um, yeah, I mean, they faced a lot of, a lot of pushback, particularly um, locally in uh, Birmingham. Um, I think that that was where they faced uh, a lot of their most uphill battles, um, but they, um, I would say that the, the they were kind of, you know, they're young and they're like really resilient and really committed and really forceful in their ideas, um, you know, at the time. Um, and so a lot of it is just like, oh, this is nonsense. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing and keep pushing forward. And they do see a lot of success in that. And I think that's one of the, the sort of features of youth activism is that ability to let things kind of roll off your back and keep moving. Um, I'd say the biggest struggle that they face is um, is really after the war with the surge in anti-communism. Um, the organization itself was never uh, formally affiliated with the party or any political party, um, but because there were communist members, um, you know, they end up on the attorney general's list of subversive organizations, um, and they run into uh, 
huge amount of trouble with the Birmingham police. Um, particularly, this is like one of the places where Bull Connor practices for what he's going to become famous for later, which is, he's of course the police commissioner who ordered fire hoses and police dogs uh, at civil rights activists in 1963. Um, he's really the bane of the existence of the SNYC in, um, in the late 1940s um, and is one of the main reasons that the organization eventually is forced to shut down. Um, so there's, there's a lot of pushback and there's a lot of resistance and a lot of struggle, um, a lot of threats, uh, a lot of danger involved in this sort of work in this time. Um, but it's really not until anti-communism sort of sweeps the nation and that hysteria takes over that the organization um, really can't function anymore. Uh, Mike had a, another question here. He was wondering if the Jacksons ever spoke much about how they felt about the state of social movements in the 21st century. Were they optimistic? Did they have any criticisms? Um, you know, I met them in the Bush two years, um, and um, they were they were disappointed about where things were going um, in that time. Um, I think they 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 did they always retained their hope in young people and always re remained committed to helping and supporting young people and their efforts. Um, and so they did. You know, they were excited about Obama and then they were excited about like the potential of various youth movements and, um, you know, would be critical of like, you know, little things about movements, but nothing glaring. Um, and so they were, uh, but I think he, he passed away in 2007 um, and uh, she's still alive. She's 104. Um, and you know, she said to me one of the last times I talked to her, uh, basically that she's, she's, you know, she thought she had seen it all really, um, but was quite uh, struck by um, just, just how, you know, unsettling things are right now. Um, and, you know, just wanted to keep encouraging people to speak and encouraging people to do what they can to push back, um, you know, and, she, she was always willing to talk to people and serve as inspiration in her old age. I had read that uh, James had started a Marxist club at Virginia Union University. I don't know if you had any more information about that. Uh, beyond the fact that it existed, I, I don't really, I'm sorry. <laughs> How about his role as editor of the school newspaper? Wasn't it called the Panther? Yeah. Um, you know, he he was so active as a student. Um, uh, I don't have a ton of uh, specifics about how he ran that, but um, I would say that it was good editorial experience for him as he went on to become editor of the the Worker in the nineteen sixties. Um, so he he used that experience. There was another, probably one of the most others like significant Virginia communists was a woman named uh, Myra Page. I don't know if you happen to know if they ever encountered one another or worked with one another. I know she wrote a lot about worker struggles in the South, like Estonia strikes and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not sure um, if they ever encountered one another. I don't think that her name came up um, in my research. And, um, what was, uh, could you go maybe again over, I know you mentioned like W.E.B. Du Bois and they had like some interminglings with him. Like, was he very influential for them or? Yeah, um, so both of them grew up kind of idolizing Du Bois. Um, he had dinner at the Jackson's house uh, once when uh, James was very young. Uh, he, <laughs> I think David Levering Lewis wrote that uh, Clara pulled out all the stops to create this, you know, elaborate meal, and he was like, "I'll have toast and tea, please." Um, so, or something along, something very simple along those lines. Um, that's in uh, that's in David Levering Lewis's Du Bois biography. Um, so they both grew up really, really idolizing Du Bois, really influenced by his. You know, they're growing up reading the children's section of the Crisis and. Um, then when Esther uh, meets him in 1945 in London, 
that really kickstarts um, like a really good rapport of friendship and then eventually a collaborative partnership um, down the road. So um, he, Du Bois came to speak at the Southern Youth Legislature, which was in Columbia, South Carolina in 1946. Uh, he gave a speech called Behold the Land, which is a brilliant and beautiful speech if you want to look it up. Um, it's wonderful. And, um, you know, he really maintained contact with the Jacksons after that point. Um, and so once they're all in New York, um, they're, uh, you know, Du Bois would have people at his house um, to talk about plans. So the Jacksons, Paul Robeson, Du Bois, other, and their wives, other leaders in this movement uh, first established a magazine called Freedom, which was really Paul Robeson's uh, grandchild in the early 1950s. And then um, that folded in the wake of sort of McCarthyism and all those pressures, plus Du Bois and uh, Robeson both lost their passports in this period. So they were facing a lot of legal challenges at this time. Um, and then in the in 1960, uh, Esther Cooper Jackson, along with Shirley Graham Du Bois and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, established Freedom Ways magazine. And that was a quarterly journal of the Black Freedom Movement that ran from 1960 to about 1985. Um, it published art, literature, political commentary, speeches, um, you know, poetry, sections of plays, like you name it, uh, from contributors all around the world. It was a platform for um, artists, thinkers, scholars who couldn't get published anywhere else to have a space to share their work. And so people like Audre Lorde, Nikki Giovanni, Alice Walker, all get their start in Freedom Ways. Um, and so that comes out of that partnership between Esther Cooper Jackson and Du Bois. Uh, James Jackson was also very influential with Du Bois. He had learned from this man his whole childhood, his whole youth was inspired by him. And he becomes a part of this group of people who are having conversations with Du Bois about the benefits of communism. Um, and so he's one of the people who really like convinced Du Bois that his ideals were in line with what the Communist Party was doing. And so Du Bois joins the Communist Party at the very end of his life. Um, and he actually sent the telegram announcing his membership to the Communist Party via the Jacksons. Um, and so they were the people who were sort of responsible for spreading that news. Um, so yeah, that, that partnership and that sort of relationship is really important for a lot of their lives. Yeah, I was going to ask, because I know he, he didn't join until like, uh, Du Bois didn't join until like the end of the 50s or 60s or something. I it was right before. I guess I'm curious how, yeah, influential the, the Jacksons were in getting him to join there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jason asks, how much do you think they seem to influence people in Richmond towards organizing into our communist politics? Um, you know, I think that the success of the um, the tobacco strikes in 37 and 38 really boosted a lot of confidence in the organization. And they left um, Richmond in a position where the conditions for the working class were better than they had found them. Um, and so I think that that bolstered a lot of com confidence. The SNYC moves out of Richmond to Birmingham in 1939. So it's only there for a couple of years, and those years are really consumed by this movement that I talked about. Um, but I do think that that had a big impact, not just uh, in Richmond, but really regionally in inspiring other uh, similar series of strikes. Yeah, you know, the I mean, the Communist Party itself didn't really cohere officially until maybe like the early 20s or something. <clears throat> and uh, I know they had activity going on in Richmond prior to all this. So I, I guess I'm kind of curious, like how influential was the Communist Party's activities in Richmond as Jackson was a, you know, a youth uh, and to him like, you know, identifying with Marxism and then eventually joining the party in the thirties. Yeah, you know, he really doesn't mention communism at all until he goes to that conference in North Carolina. But I think one of the other important sort of features of communism in the 1930s in the United States is that this is a moment where, um, you know, the, the party itself is really reshaping itself to adapt to local conditions and to 
um, be less kind of forceful and hierarchical about their approach to organizing. Um, and so in the Popular Front uh, years, uh, this is a, a Soviet initiative that happens in 1935, but it's something that spreads throughout the United States as well. The idea was to just like get involved by talking to people and sharing ideas and not to be like join the Communist Party, but to be like, here are what here's what I think about what's going on socially or economically in your neighborhood. And here's what we think we can do about it. And you don't have to join the Communist Party, but here are my ideas, right? And so that's the way that that sort of communist influence is spreading for the most part, like in, across the, the country in the 1930s, the party itself experiences a surge in membership in the 1930s, but I think it only gets to maybe 75,000 people. So it's still really small. Um, but the spread of communist uh, influenced ideas is much, much larger than that. And that's one of the reasons that you see like a lot of hysteria later on about people who signed petitions. Like they probably were never members of the Communist Party, but they agreed with what they said in the 1930s. Um, and I think that that's, that's where that influence comes from. Jackson himself, he was, uh, once he joined the Communist Party, he was committed um, and he was there. Um, he, he resigned from the party very late in his life because there was some controversy over his pension. Um, but, uh, you know, eventually, um, you know, he, he kind of stuck with the people, and the ideas. Jason had another question. He said, uh, do you think the Jacksons still held or hold on to revolutionary politics when you spoke with them? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things you see like a lot of people experience as activists is that, you know, with age comes a little bit of softening. Um, but both of them were, were very outspoken and very committed to, um, to their ideals. Uh, I think their priorities shifted a little bit. Um, so later in life, both of them are, are very much involved in commemorative um, struggles, right? So like Esther Jackson was part of the, um, group that really fought for the landmarking of Du Bois's birthplace in Great Barrington and fought to really preserve the legacy of these voices from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and so their priorities shift a little bit. They're not um, as able to be out on the front lines of the struggle anymore. But like I said, they also fostered a lot of solidarity with young people, a lot of sort of cross-pollination of ideas with different organizations. And even as they're working with for example, Esther Jackson working with Freedom Ways, um, her whole position with that was that they should have contributors from lots of different political perspectives and that they should have communist influence, communist influence and communist contributors, but then they should also take uh, contributions from, um, for example, the president of the National Urban League, right, which is a much more conservative wing of the civil rights movement. Um, and they should put all of these voices into conversation with each other so that people can really make sense of what works for them. Um, and that was really her lifelong approach to activism. And so while her role and her priorities shift over the years, um, that's sort of at the forefront of her approach. Could you maybe dig in a little more between that shift from the 1928 Black Belt thesis, you know, of the recognition that there is a Black nation in the United States to then, you know, like going into the Popular Front period where they kind of abandoned that line and, and maybe how that influenced uh, the Jacksons or what was their response to that? Yeah, I mean, like I said, um, James Jackson was responsible in large part for drafting the new position on the Negro question in the 1950s. Um, so he wasn't super committed to the Black Belt thesis idea because what we do see, like you said, in the 1930s with the Popular Front, there's an increased emphasis on interracial working class solidarity and utilizing those connections to fight economic exploitation and that the dismantling of economic oppression will help to dismantle racial oppression, right? So that that's the approach that, um, you know, even if the party is still kind of in the line of thinking of the Black Belt thesis, the approach that's working is this other sort of angle on it, um, which is this like interracial working class solidarity and, you know, using 
the power of the masses to dismantle um, economic power, which reproduces racial inequality. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, it's really when uh, Jack gets involved in the party leadership um, through the, like the late forties and early fifties that he starts really focusing on policy itself. But like I said, he's got this experience where he's underground. He's got this little bit of distance from things and he's writing as a person who is, you know, sort of able to be critical of party policy and to think through, um, you know, what he wants out of the party um, and then reformulate its approach for the 1960s. And I think what he's able to do in that moment is, um, is really like, again, he takes over as editor of the worker in the 1960s. He takes those ideas and puts them on their editorial page, right? Um, and he promotes stories that reflect um, not just like civil rights, but like that, that same sort of uh, sense of solidarity for the 1960s. Do you know what his um, attitudes or feelings were when you have the development of like the new left and the new communist movement where they break away from the communist party and they deem it revisionist, you know, and you have figures like say Harry Haywood who were like very adamant about the black national question in opposition to, you know, I guess what they would say is like Jackson upholding a like liquidating the national question. Yeah. Um... There's a lot of factionalism. Um, I think one of the things, like while while Jack has uh, you know a really strong sense of commitment to the party through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, the party itself really has a lot of trouble regrouping after McCarthyism. Um, between that and the Khrushchev report, people left in droves. The membership really dwindled, and Jack is kind of trying to think of a rebuilding strategy. And one of the things he sees is this opportunity with civil rights, but um, they're unable to really like these factional debates, they're unable to tap into the things that are going on that would have really benefited the party. Like the, like drawing on black nationalism, drawing on new left ideas that are pulling themselves from communist influence. Um, but the party itself is just, it's, it, it gets more and more insular even as it's trying to refix, rebuild itself, you know, sort of fix its approach to things. So it gets kind of stuck. I would say Freedom Ways is a better avenue for looking at that kind of um, relationship uh, where you start, where you're seeing, um, you know, Esther Jackson and her editorial board drawing contributions from all across the political spectrum and really putting people in conversation with one another. One of the things that also happens with the Jacksons is they have teenagers at this time, um, and you know their daughter is in college and she wants to go live for you know live live for a year in Hungary or something and you know go to Europe and you know they're like wait wait a second there's you know there are movements happening here that you should be a part of be involved in and um, so there's there's that pressure as parents as well right and looking at young, younger people while they like appreciate and respect young people they've also got daughters who they're trying to, you know, help launch into adulthood. Um, yeah. Weren't they connected to Angela Davis? Were they in, of any influence to Angela Davis? Absolutely. Uh, Angela Davis's mother was part of the Southern Negro Youth Congress in Birmingham. So Angela grew up playing with Harriet Jackson, their daughter, um, and they remained connected. Um, and uh, James Jackson was a uh, part of the, you know, they were both involved in the efforts to defend Angela Davis in the 70s, um, you know, when she becomes a national figure um, and remained connected with her, you know, lifelong connection there. And her mother was an activist. Um, well, well, we'll give a, one more second here for some folks to have any further questions. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you've been going at it here for an hour and a half now and definitely appreciate that but um maybe uh what any in terms of like a departing message here what do you think would be the greatest relevance or message that the jacksons could uh partake for current generations of, of communists or organizers in virginia right now um i think that probably their most effective um 
message and approach was about that kind of creating coalitions and building solidarity in unexpected places because uh, you know they really saw the power of what could happen when um, you know people that uh, those in power tried to keep divided when those people united um, they could be a force to be reckoned with and they could dismantle some of that power um, and I think you see that in the tobacco strikes and they see that um, in other instances throughout their lives so I think coalition building um, collaboration and you know of course you know being true to your ideals but also listening uh, to others and understanding the perspectives of people who have different experiences uh, can be really powerful as uh, you know as activists um, you know initiatives that emerge and um, I, I would say that that's probably the thing that they focused on the most in their life was um, was creating connections and you know inspiring and influencing and remembering your history. Um, you know, remembering the people who paved the way before you, um, and they tried to keep that up to the end of their lives as well. Um, so I think that those are probably among the most important things. Well, if there's no more questions, you know, uh, we'll, we'll call it an end here. And just again, wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to share this important history with us and would encourage all folks to get your book and uh, stay tuned on some future materials. Yes, James and that's for Cooper Jackson. Um, crucial Virginia history here, working class history, black history. Um, and, you know, we'll stay in touch and happy to keep promoting your stuff as it comes out. And uh, again, thank you. Yes, I'll put my email in the chat in case anyone has any questions. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out if anything comes to mind. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate it. And, um, you know, we'll stay in touch and keep this correspondence going. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the good work that you guys are doing. It's awesome. Great.